Thank you for staying with us on the AM show. It is indeed my pleasure this morning. I've talked so much about women and they're having certain crucial positions in our country. And today I'm excited because I have one such woman uh, right to my side. You'll see her in a bit. In June 2023, thereabouts, I believe, she was actually 2021, it was. She was actually uh, nominated, put forward, went through vetting, and she became a deputy minister of information. Now, since that time, it actually makes sense because that reminds me of Dr. Mustafa Hamid ceding to um, Kojopon Kroma, who was then deputy. So it appears the information ministry has had quite a, a system going on. Now she's been put forward by Mr. President to be the substantive minister of information. She joins me this morning for breakfast. Fatih Abubakar is her name. Good morning, Fatih. Good morning, Benjamin. Um, Sanazwa. Sanukade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So good to have you in the studio. Like I said, I'm excited and I've, I've shared it with you before even the show started. But how excited are you? Why is this I am so excited. But first of all, let me say uh, good morning to you and your crew once again mm -hmm. and to your cherished viewers. I would also like to use the opportunity to express my profound gratitude to the President of the Republic for the confidence reposed in me. He has nominated me twice and appointed me as a Deputy Director of Communications at the Presidency mm. for a four-year period. Mm. So I'm, I'm so excited that he has set confidence in me and has given me the opportunity to serve again. All right. For those who may not know too much about Fatih Abubakar, just tell us, who are you? Uh, even before you came into government and all of that, who are you? What, what have you been up to? I'm a lawyer and an entrepreneur. Okay. Um, some people, popular, those who have followed my uh, political career, at least in the last 40 years mm -hmm. that I've been in active political communication since 2010, uh, they call me ch from Chobba to Ghanaba. <laughs> no, <laughs> I see. I'm a lawyer and I'm an entrepreneur in the food sector. I've, okay. I've, I've run a family. You've been business. in all the bars. Yes, I've been in all the bars. Mm. So I love that business. I'm 37. Okay. Uh, I hail from Garu in the Upper East region, but I was born and raised in Kumasi. Okay. I am passionate about youth development, uh, women empowerment. I am a natural advocate. I have done it over and over again. And that, that's where my, my passion is. Mm. So in June 2021, um, you became a substantive uh, deputy information uh, minister. And uh, since that time, you've, I've been to a few of those engagements at the information ministry and seen you uh, there. Some I've watched on TV. But now you've been proposed to be the minister. You are the minister designate. Um, that means you'll have to go through another round of vetting because yeah, this is your first time that you're going for the ministerial that, that's uh, position. What, what, what are your expectations? You've been through this before as a deputy. What are your expectations on that level? Okay, so um, I am privileged to be nominated to a ministry where I've already worked before. I have been part of a team right. that has come up with policies seen to the implementation of those policies and has a continuous program, at least for the 2024 uh, budget that was passed last year. Mm. So I have clarity on what we are expected to do within the period. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, by virtue of this nomination, the President of the Republic has personally communicated to me his expectations of the office. So I am not going to reinvent the wheel especially some of the innovative uh, media support programs that Honorable Opon Kroma initiated, like the Coordinated Mechanism on Safety of Journalists, the Media Capacity Enhancement Program, and other campaigns that we started at the ministry are things that I believe I should um, renew the energy and make sure we see to the continuous implementation of those. And of course, uh, as a uh, minister designates, I am expected to give direction and guidance as to how we will assist the various ministries, departments, and agencies of government 
uh, to communicate government's uh, projects and policies. Mm. And by virtue of my experience at the party communications, Jubilee House Communications, and the Ministry of Information, and within the period, getting the rare privilege uh, to learn from the likes of Mr. Kwekusechi, Ado Presidential Advisor, Honorable Oboshi Sai Kofi, Madam Elizabeth Ohene, Gabi Asari Ochidakun, and the complete architecture of uh, the government communication as we know it uh, within the period. I believe I'm equipped and resource enough with a very formidable team of counselors uh, to, to help me put my best foot forward. I see. Uh, just a quick thought. What was it like working with Kojo Pankuma? Phenomenal. Mm. Yes. Uh, Kojo is selfless. Uh, he's very confident in his abilities. He was never threatened by the fact that <laughs> I am a loud advocate, let me put it that way. He gave me all the opportunities to even come up with some laudable ideas that I believe could help enhance government communications at the ministry. And the existing programs, he assigned some to me, like he has always mentioned, of the minister's press briefing, which has about four components. One has to do with the updates on public health emergencies, including COVID. We had the update on specified entities in collaboration with the state's interest and governance authority. And we did the state of the region's report with all the regional ministers. Over the period, we have also put together some uh, media campaigns or media tours for some of these key uh, sector heads <coughs> and ministers to go around and talk about their mandates and their success stories. Mm. So you feel the word you used was phenomenal. Um, some, some feel that the Kojo Paul Krumah they knew, especially working in the media, right here, in these very walls, in these confines, was not the same Kojo Paul Krumah after a while that they got to know in terms of many different dynamics and his defense sometimes of the indefensible. But one crucial point, Many feel that, especially coming from the media fold, the media fraternity, uh, he did not do enough to protect journalists. You've been following the Press Freedom Index. Mm -hmm. Two years back to back, our scores have dwindled. Um, <clears throat> I remember from last year, I think we actually made some marginal gains in Africa, but that's because there was a wide fall from many countries. And people feel he's not done enough to protect journalists. The, the number of cases that have come up about journalists being assaulted, killed, um, among others, have been horrifying. How do, you, how do you respond to that? Has it not been done on that score? Uh, that, that hasn't been the reflection of what has been happening at the ministry. And with your kind permission, I would like to point some incidents and in how the Honorable Minister responded to those incidents. Mm. But before I go to that, let me remind you that in 2021, Reporters Without Borders, who come up with the F uh, Press Freedom Index, review the indicators mm. for uh, the decision or, or positioning of a particular country in terms of performance. Mm. And you realize that when indicators, including economic conditions and others were introduced, Ghana was doing so well. Ghana scored like an A. Uh, if you want to put any score above 70 as an A, when it comes to the legal regime and legislation, we did quite well. Even for um, safety of journalists, we were above average. Mm. The challenge we had within the instance is that when the new um, indicators were introduced, we were also facing uh, with an era where we have migrated substantially over the past three decades mm. from a system where we had only one TV station, one uh, radio station with some form of censorship to a regime under the 1992 uh, constitution uh, where we have proliferation of media houses moving the number of registered entities for electronic media to over 700. Uh, in that instance, and some research from the School of Communication Studies and other stakeholders within the fraternity are saying that we have too many media houses that are not sustainable. If you look at the ones that are established, sometimes about a 30 collapse within six months. 
So we have not been able to score above 50 when it comes to economic condition. And you're blaming, you're blaming the restructuring of, of the, uh, you know, the scheme. That, that, that is what you're blaming uh, not, for this. Not if, to, if, you're, if you're a good blame, scorer, if you're a good student, yes. no matter what parameters are used, you, you have to show that you, you are an excellent student, right? I, I don't think the other countries that are still at the top um, are complaining about the fact that some marginal parameters have been changed. And I, I remember Kojo Pongkruma made mention of this, but I'll go back to my point. If oh. you're an excellent student, the fact that they add bond mass or something else or quantitative uh, bits to mathematics shouldn't make you fail, should it? Let, let me mention something interesting to you. Uh, not to blame them, but I'm saying that the review of the indicators to include welfare and all that is a good thing, but it has exposed the, the challenges that we have in media practice in Ghana. Mm. I believe it is public. It is, the media space is largely privately owned, but that notwithstanding, I believe you agree with me that when it comes to the economic conditions and living conditions of media practitioners in general, there is more room for improvement. But comparatively, if you look at some countries like Burkina, you look at some countries like Niger or Guinea, even within West Africa sub-region, some of the countries that perform better than us. Because I remember when the first scoring under the new indicators came, there was a stakeholder meeting for us to look at how we can deal with the situation. Mm. You have Niger mm. with about uh, 15 radio and TV stations mm. nationwide. You have Guinea with eight So, so the problem stations. is the proliferation of media entities? Be, so it, it is part of it because it is part, the regime that is operating in Ghana in general. It's been admitted. Quite recently, CDD came up with uh, some research findings. We were all at um, uh, moving pick to listen and make contributions. And across board, including the deputy ranking member uh, for the communications committee in parliament, there were proposals that in some instances, the regime that we are practicing is not sustainable. So it is part of it, but I'm not saying it's the only issue. There's been instances where complaints of um, threats or actual use of force on journalists have come up. Mm. And if you will bear me, I'll first. If I might that, add, within the last few years, the numbers have been pretty high, which I'm sure you're aware of, including yes. the instances where politically aligned people have walked into radio and TV stations, assaulted people. I remember this way from what? Uh, the, the times when, um, what's that reverend's name? Um, I don't know, um, um, I'll, I'll just try to recall his name. I, I think my, my crew will help me remember his name. He, he kept, you know, up with some of these assaults. And because he was seen to be very aligned to the MPP and to the president, um, uh, these went on. I, I believe it got, to the, uh, it got to a head at some point. He was apprehended once and that was it. But this was a man who had led people, armed people, at a point, uh, if I recall, ben Benjamin, to, to go to an, uh, you know, a media entity. I say this because I sit here. Okay. And we've had people, you remember the latest UTV one, the Cape FM? I mean, it's, it's I, becoming I, I, a real problem. I was problem. coming to that. Real problem. I, I was coming to that. We have been following even the research findings by Media Foundation for West Africa. Mm. When they have the engagement, we go and sit in. And my problem is that we have a general problem of how people respond to dissent, especially when it comes to publications whether they are false news, whether they are misinformation, whether they are defamatory. If you look at the incidents, you will not so, even so the person, the my, my, my able producer one. has reminded yes. me it was um, Ousu Bempa. Oh, okay. Ousu Bempa I was okay. referencing. That. So yeah. my point is that we follow the research. And if you look at the incidents, you will not even rank political actors as one. Mm. It spans from security agencies to, of course, political actors. It could be traditional and religious authority. It could be on, uh, ordinary Ghanaians. It could be incidents as a sports stadium. We have a general misunderstanding or lack of appreciation of the independence of the journalists and their freedom to report what they have seen and how they should go about it. Mm. And I think in that instance, we have unanimously come around the table and say, one, 
we agree to prosecution right. and pursuit of justice for victims of assault. Two, there is the need for a collective action when it comes to sensitization. Three, even the NMC, the GJA, and other people have also come to the agreement that sometimes uh, issues of ethics and professionalism and how even training to how to sense risk, how to act during risk, how to assess some of these situations have come up. But it appears when it is not the politician, then it is not an important conversation. Mm. But we at the Ministry of Information have remained allies uh, to stakeholders within the space. Right. And let me give you three key instances. If you would remember, in the case that you, ref you referred to at UTV, it was the Minister for Information who reported to the police, yeah. issued a statement, read out immediately mm. to the production team and the host they mentioned on air mm. in course of the program. Mm. In the case of Benya FM well, in Pete, Central from, from what I hear, he was reached out to, and then that happened. And, and I don't dispute yes. that because I'm fully aware of yes. that. And, but there have been instances Adam, where it's not been so forthcoming. And even statements from your ministry mm -hmm. under the leadership of Kojo Ponkrumah, where it's been, even been suggested that we, we too... Uh, in some way are liable in a way. It's not to say that, the, the, I wish I had some of those statements to express to you properly. You, you must be aware of them. Uh, it's not about the, um, the professionalism of the work, but almost as though we ought to know better in certain instances. The media is free. Yes, freedom has its own, your freedom ends where someone else's freedom begins. But if you're simply doing your job, and then like what we saw with... Um, and that's purported because the journalist is in the process of proving the matter I know has gone to the MPP's, um, um, is it the NEC, the National Executive Council? I saw recently a statement, Farouk Aliou Mahama, Yendi, and the purported assault of a city FM mm -hmm. uh, journalist and all of that. All those dynamics paint a certain picture and it's injuring the country. So you were making a point yes. about uh, some of the work you, you So you let me, doing. interestingly, let me tell you something. I mentioned three instances, Ada. Uh, Benya UTV, where the ministry was even involved mm. in assisting with investigation, looking for perpetrators, reaching out to the district police commanders to make sure on our account, to assure them that we are not interested in shielding anybody. And if because of our office, they will think twice before pursuing prosecution, they have our full support. In this specific instance, mm. with uh, Farouk's case, because uh, he's in court. I, I am a bit constrained as and, a lawyer and, and to I, go into the I details. Understand. But you remember there was this issue about um, the GJ's announcement How, I was, about I was going a to journalist get being assaulted mm. at uh, a, a vetting, uh, pro, during a vetting process in Central Region. Mm. And the they mentioned that... Is, is the Cape the, FM one you're refer referencing? Yes. Right. And some of the people mm -hmm. who were part of it were wearing honorable Hawakumsin's T-shirt. Let me inform you that as of yesterday, mm. the minister herself, myself, we sent a delegation, met the full complement of GJA, Giba, Media Foundation of West Africa, all the key <clears throat> agencies so that we can assist with the investigation. So the impression I see under Kojo's leadership or with my assistance, we have not been pursuing actions. I, I don't think I suggested that you hadn't. Yeah, I yes, just suggested, yes. in fact, when I made mention of Kojo, I said people felt he had not done enough. Okay. And, and I said that I would even be willing to pardon you on certain grounds, but for him, because he comes from the fold, people hold him to higher standards in, in dealing with such issues. But moving forward then, there are other issues. And, and don't worry, we'll come back to the reshuffle and who gets what and everything we expect of you. But you look at the media dynamics. Mm -hmm. There have been times when some media entities have been shut down and some have felt they were politically motivated. And when you, re you look at the fine print, you, you might want to think along those lines at a certain point. We all know the radio goals, the XYZs back then and everything that happened, the power FMs. But at the same time, I do agree mm -hmm. that a lot of the media entities we have, sometimes you, you look at TV, watch what an entity is showing, and even the bit that has become occultism or juju and all of that, money making, money, whatever. And then you also listen to some of the stations. It is obvious something is not right, 
Are they all running? Are those the entities you're speaking of that must, must go? And what's, what are the not, mechanisms? Not, not necessarily. We are not talking about letting go of any entity. Mm. I'm saying that there were proposals at the CDD event that some must even, they must do if it has to take measures or other agreements to make them sustainable. Right. The Minister for Information, or former Minister for Information, now Minister for Works and Housing, designated my, my, my boss, Honorable Kojo. But when you just called him the former Minister for Information, <laughs> he, he's because, still at post, right? Yeah, yes. Is he not still at post? You know, the president the will do appointments and then before putting them in another okay. place. Right. So we are, we are still he's you know, processing. Yes, we are in the transition phase. Right. But... The minister lobbied with the assistance of the President of the Republic to get the head office of International Fund for Public Interest Media, IFIM, to be situated in Ghana because we believe sustainability and the viability of uh, media houses are important to improving our indicators. And we believe that if we are the hosts and they are operating here, issues about funding support for media houses, operational support, even salary payment support. We will be in the position to add our voices and advocate for such assistance to the media houses. So we do not by any major, uh, measure seek to shut some up, close some down, or stop any media house whatsoever from operating. But if you can improve the quality of operations, then of course, I know our performances will get better. That, that being said... But, but, but if these media houses are not meeting the standards, and, 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 I, and I do not want to think that of the proliferation, all of them, because there are, there are times when you've spoken about some of what they should be paying that they are not paying, uh, some that are putting out content that is not. So are we saying all of them are, and, and we are going to let them be? Is that, is um, that the... That is why we are working so hard to get the broadcasting bill passed. Right. If you look at the constitutional provision and the legal regime that we have operated over the period, there were, there were a lot of loopholes, let me put it that way, because the National Media Constitution, by the, uh, National Commission. Media Commission, by virtue of the 1992 Constitution, is the regulator of contents. Right. The National Communications Authority is the regulator of spectrum. Although under the, the, the fundamental freedoms, free press is guaranteed. But that unfettered um, right or freedom comes with the fact that when it comes to the electronic space, we look at uh, the spectrum as a, a resource, a limited resource. And you would need a regulator like the NCA to look at what is available, where, that there are no breaches, people are not interrupting with your broadcasts uh, and all that. But because of the way they run, if there is no seamless conversation or interaction between NMC, who is the regulator of contents, and NCA, who is the regulator of spectrum, NCA can have the best monitoring rooms, seeing all that is happening on TV and everything. But if they are not close with the, the powers to say, I am stopping you because you are showing this and that, and they don't have the support of the NMC, it will be almost impossible. Mm -hmm. So that is why we've, they are among the key stakeholders that we are dealing with, looking at how we can facilitate the passage of the broadcasting bill. Mm -hmm. If quite, quite recently, if you followed the activities of the Ministry of Information, we have done stakeholder engagements mm -hmm. uh, on the media support programs. Mm -hmm. We have done engagements on the misinformation campaign. We have done engagements on even how the, the agencies and stakeholders who have regulatory powers will be able to work together. And we were at Alisa quite recently with Raymond that as the moderator with Facebook, other people, the parliamentary select committee making inputs as to how we can improve upon the legislative framework that we work within currently. Let's talk about this interesting bit. It is said that one in three, uh, or even half in some instances, of media entities are owned by politicians or political actors or people close to people who walk the corridors of power. 
many reports have pointed to the fact that that in itself is a major problem. If you have a lot of media houses dominated by the NDC and the MPP, what it means is that sometimes you will get information skewed in a certain way. It happens in some of the newspapers as well. You can, I will not mention any names, but you can guarantee that if you pick newspaper X or Y or Z, they are likely, same story, to spin it in this direction. And if you pick newspaper A, B, C, it's likely to be spun in another direction. And you will be spot on nine out of ten times. How are we dealing with that situation? It's, it's a reflection. First of all, do you acknowledge it's a problem? Oh, yes, and yes. How, how, yes. How are we uh, through our engagements, our recent engagements, it has come up strongly. Mm -hmm. And we have so many sentiments to express as to the, the, the quality of work based on media ownership. But that will not override their right to free media or free press. Right. So until you get everybody agreeing that this is a problem, so we cannot, we cannot stop the NMC from giving licenses to people who qualify and have applied and have capacity to set up the, infrastructure, the infrastructural requirements to run a media house. If there is the agreement uh, from key stakeholders that something should be done about it, right. then the amendments that are happening within the draft of the broadcasting bill would take into account some of these sentiments and we would have it um, codified in whatever laws we are about to pass. Because at the moment, if from the, the, the goodness of your heart or based on our, our individual sentiments or the, or the sentiments of Honorable Kojo upon Kroma, you say, okay, let us reduce the number of media houses, let's stop give, issuing licenses, let's put a ban on this, the same media houses and platforms will come here shouting that they want to gag I, us. I, they are I, not giving us. I, I don't. I don't think up. because media houses, as long as I've been in this mm -hmm. space and from the number of people I've engaged, it, it's not about don't gag, don't muzzle, don't don't try to um, force media houses out or gag them. But at the same time, media practitioners have said that there ought to be some sanity. I think there's always been an agreement on that because we ourselves sometimes look at content and we ask ourselves, okay, so this one is also running, but this content vis-a-vis, -vis, typical example, sometimes you would have some of them showing content that is adult content during certain periods within the day. And you know that at that time, there could likely be children at home and all of that. Uh, those dynamics, obviously, and then you ask yourself, okay, so the NMC, the National Media Commission, which is supposed to regulate uh, some of that, the content, what are they doing? Are they aware these entities exist? And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, so that is the line. It's not about general media, and, mm -hmm. but, but some of these entities yes. you see and you get worried. Yes, so uh, within the mandate of the Ministry of Information, we appreciate uh, some of the concerns that you have raised, but we also have to put it on the table that in the operations of the National Media Commission, we do not interfere in the operational and administrative decisions. All the regulatory uh, decisions within the period. That is why we saw the need to help build capacity within the space and enlighten people through the Media Capacity Enhancement Program. And in doing so, we came up with a working committee chaired by Professor Kwame Nakwansa of Unimac. And last month, the second cohort graduated. If, if you remember, we had the first cohort in Kumase, no. which was opened by Otun Fose to the second, the Asante Hine, in March. We have the third cohort at Unimac uh, Jolo campus again. So over the period, we think that, first of all, it's a fact that not everybody within the media space had the benefit of going through journalism school. Mm -hmm. Some are operating based on passion, based on raw talent, based on opportunity or availability. In so doing, the person may be as eloquent as they come, but in terms of ethics, in terms of uh, the legal requirements, in terms of technical issues, they may not be as equipped. We have created this opportunity so that if they go through the program and acquire certificate from Unimac, the standards will be raised. 
they will be further mm -hmm. equipped to do the right thing. Okay. So from our part, that is what, under the leadership of Honorable Kujo Upon Kruma, we've started, and after two cohorts and going into the third cohort, we are still pursuing. Okay. I will um, quickly move on to other issues. I'll come back here because there are still the issues of the RTI and okay. challenges and all that. But the final point, because of that meeting, you made mention of mm -hmm. um, GBA and, and other entities. Mm -hmm. the, the GJA's plan now um, with the president focusing on, you know, well, not focusing, but bringing up blackouts, for example. So the likes of Mivzawa Kumsin, Farouk Ali Muhammad, and others have come up. But what do you make of that strategy? Uh, I've heard Mr. Ayeboafo speak on it. I've heard others also root for it. What is your position on that? Uh, it's, it's their prerogative as GJA to take decisions uh, which they believe will protect uh, the membership of GJA. That being said, my position has been that although you have the right, looking at the media landscape that we have in Ghana, would it be the most effective tool? Uh, that answer... Uh, it's, it's maybe I, I will get it from the GJ in our subsequent interactions. Mm. Because you may put a blackout on somebody, but a, media, a privately owned media house, and we know that we still have journalists in the country who do not have affiliation to any association. Mm. They will still go ahead uh, to do publications, to do what they want. So the best case scenario is that we sit at the table find lasting solution if it's justice we are seeking mm. we get the support of the executive or the executive arm of government we push the security agencies to facilitate their investigations and also get uh, gg and the allies to come to the table to say you know what we want the same thing mm. we are pursuing the same course mm. so what is the best case scenario in this instance and remember Every single case of infringement is different. And sometimes the circumstances are also different. Right. So if we don't look at the nuances and look at how we are rehabilitating the victim, how we are pursuing prosecution collectively, and we say, okay, we are that side, you are that side, do it and let's see. We know how the justice system works in this country. And it's not even with just criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can be pursuing the case in courts they have to look at procedure and take their time to make sure justice is saved. It can be a year, two, three, four, so on and so forth. There are cases that are even over 20 years in the country. Right. But in the meantime, we want to come together, sit, look at how we are rehabilitating victims, giving them the assurances that, no, we do not support this. You should have the confidence to go back to your work whilst we are collectively assisting to make sure we prosecute. Right. You, but remember that in the past, there has also been instances where people have mentioned incidents that turned out not to be true. Right. And when that happens, you need to engage so that we can validate each case on its merits. And that is why the ministry, in collaboration with NMC, came up with a coordinated mechanism on the safety of journalists so that when there is an incident and you are not confident enough to report on your own, you will get the full complement of the committee set up by the NMC to make sure they assist you to go through the processes. Mm. And um, I, I just wanted to piggyback on that and go to some of the matters we've already discussed. But, but and, and in respect of the reshuffle, it's, it's really good to have you here because uh, I believe we are, we are the first entity to have any proper conversation with you since you, you became minister-designate. Um, on the back of all these that we've discussed, and there'll be more to come, what then can we expect from you, you, as minister? I want to believe you will sail through. Um, for some of us who support women, uh, it is our hope that you do sail through. But um, what then specifically will you do in that position? What can we expect from you at the helm of affairs? Okay, uh, bef bef before I, I respond to that, uh, let me add that I don't support politicians boycotting media houses because of their content. If for anything, you don't support politicians boycotting media houses? Yes. Right. Okay, uh, you have to catch your breath right and, there. And that's an interesting <coughs> point, a very interesting one to make. <coughs> and, and in that same breath, mm. I think together with uh, GJ. Be, 
beyond the blacklisting and all that, we can explore other more effective avenues uh, in seeking compliance and redress for those who are affected in some of these instances. Okay. Um, uh, and right. To, back to your question. Mm. Uh, expectations, uh, as I mentioned, I have been part and parcel of the current regime in terms of how we are managing the information sector, the policy directions. So I have clarity that uh, God willing, if I, I get the confirmation of parliament, inshallah, inshallah mm -hmm. I will get to continue some of our legacy projects okay. that we have already. Some of those you've already mentioned. Right. Some of those I have already mentioned. Mm -hmm. I am also aware that we are within an election period. Mm -hmm. And within the mandate of President Nana Adodankwe Kufuado, there are so many projects that we have started that are now completed, that are coming up. I, I believe, especially like railway sector, other sectors, you've seen snippets of completed and yet to be commissioned uh, projects. Uh, I believe it is our prerogative to assist the, the source or the implementing ministries to come up with um, government communication plans that will help educate Ghanaians and also explain to them government's choices of policy direction, projects that we started, why we started them, completion, and the social impact that those projects will have in the country. So more advocacy right. more ad and, and making myself more accessible to the media so that if they have any questions, we won't leave vacuum for misinformation, but will adequately communicate the position of government. Now, some have spoken about time. The question is, will you have enough time to be able to do anything meaningful between now and the end of this administration's uh, tenure? Technically, it's maybe around March thereabouts that you, you probably would start having a full um, hands on deck to, to start working. Between March and November thereabouts, it's practically the electoral season. So do you think there's enough time to make anything uh, of this uh, position that has been thrust upon you? I, I, I trust in the judgment of His Excellency the President, uh, who by our constitution has the prerogative or has the vested executive power. And at any point in time, uh, he thinks there is a need to make certain changes to re-energize the system for whatever reason whatsoever, because the constitution does not uh, require him to, te ask, uh, to tell us why. I can only speak for myself what he expects from me. And I believe within the period there is so much we can do. Do not also forget that in most instances we are talking about uh, appointees who have either served as deputy ministers in those sectors or two who have served on the parliamentary select committee uh, that have oversight responsibility over those ministries or in a way or the other who have had the benefits to follow the activities or have the academic uh, qualification to work within those spaces. And because it is the same government in terms of handing over, in terms of transitioning, I believe it will be as seamless as, as possible for us to continue uh, the, the, the programs and projects of government. So I'm confident that what is expected of us within the period will be delivered. Right. That, that's a tactful way of going about it. Uh, the president and his prerogative. I was actually focusing more on what you would do, but it's, it's all right. Government, there's, there's been a shakeup of government and crucial. Everyone has been talking about Ken Oforiata, now a special investment envoy, senior advisor and all of that. Some have said he's even more powerful now than he would have been at the ministry of uh, finance. The Franklin Kujos, the Dr. Kojopun Punis of the CDD, the Mary Ades and others, uh, Professor Ali Duseidu, all of them have been pointing to that, that fact. There's also been, uh, there have been a number of interesting names, Dakwa Newman for gender, uh, which, which again is, is a bonus with more women in such positions. Henry Quarte moving to interior, among others. Uh, this, this new team, what do you think it will do? What, what some have said that, look, we are under an IMF program, contracts have been signed, deals have been struck. There's practically nothing that can be done. But for you, what do you see from where you sit with this new 
uh, group, including you, who are now on board? I, I am excited, and I believe the rest are. With regards to Honorable Ken Uforiata and his powers, I would advise that we don't go into the speculations. You, you know, uh, Ghana is one country where we have one coach on the field, and we have about 32 30, million, 31 co million others. coaches uh, <laughs> out there with all sorts of conspiracy theories and all sorts of uh, tactics, and people who have not hit the ball before right. will be telling you about Formation 442 and so on and so forth. Right. So please. Uh, but it's also down. because the people have become very, very, I, I wouldn't say skeptical, but on the back of the political gymnastics that our politicians play with us, people have become inured to trickery and treachery. And so they, they, they want to train their eyes on the ball, wouldn't you say? D more know. discernment. No, I don't, I don't think so. You think I, so? I, I cannot. <laughs> I, I so cannot you don't think Ghanaian, Ghanaians have become more discerning? Uh, oh, of course, Ghanaians have always been discerning. I mean, but uh, on a lighter note, there are times that uh, so many issues have come up. People have speculated and then it turned out not to be true. Mm. So especially for those of us with bigger platforms, we bear a, a, a bigger or higher responsibility to make sure we also don't speculate, but limit to what is within our knowledge and belief. Mm. So I can't speculate, but I am confident that at the Ministry of Information, uh, we are equipped, it's the same team throughout. Uh, we still have our government spokespersons and the full complement of the ministries, agencies and staff. Mm. And it is only because the expertise of Honorable Kojo Pankroma is needed elsewhere that the president has sent him to execute the mandate there. But we will hold the fort to the best of our ability and make sure the vision of the president of the republic is executed to perfection. I have an interesting question for you. Okay. Are you going to miss him, Kojo Pankroma? Oh, definitely. Definitely, I will. I mm. will. I went to, you know, Kojo is somebody that I greatly admired a long time ago. I have done so many things in my lifetime that maybe because of how reserved I am, people don't know about it. I was with a, a brother, Kofi Sefa Bonsu, who is uh, into sound and camera. He's quite well known. Oh, he's, okay. he's done production for over two decades. And I used to hold his cameras accompany him to set. I remember one particular instance in 2010 or 2011, MTN was shooting a commercial at uh, East Ligon, and Jessica Saforo and Honorable Kojo Pong Kroma were supposed to be part of that campaign with, uh, uh, is it just a, uh, one gentleman, Bentuma, forgotten the first name, uh, part, part of the crew as well. So I was somehow, you know, associated with production, just assisting, and then my, I had another former boss, uh, Edgar Ebiko, uh, who was also into production. When, when uh, Multi TV started, she was into operations, and we did a lot of production for TV3 as well from 2007 to 2008 when they were shooting the Darling Look Smart Quiz and Beauty Diaries. Right. So it was from admiration, someone I was eager to meet. I wouldn't mind holding the, the clothes and helping them on set. And he became a brother. So when I got the opportunity to come and work at the ministry, it, it was so comfortable because we knew each other, we respected each other. So and the rapport was, was there? Oh, absolutely. And he was personally interested in my growth. And if there were instances that I was holding back, he would give me the assurances that I think you can do more than you think. I, I believe in your capacity. So I am eternally grateful to him. And his predecessor as well, Dr. Uh, Mustafa, Amid. Dr. Mustafa Amid. I was his secretary at Dankwa Institute when he became oh. the executive director. Now these are complex so, you are bringing yes, up that we didn't he has, know. He has taught me. Right. I've learned from him. He has built me. Right. Uh, they have... And all the people I mentioned earlier, they have personally invested in my, my, my growth and carried me uh, to pursue uh, capacity building in ways that I cannot express. So I'm riding on all those uh, big shoulders uh, to make sure I am able to meet whatever standards exist at the ministry. Mm. My very able um, producer, Echo, he keeps sending me information today. So uh, is it Timothy Bentum? You yes, know, yes. Timothy. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Uh, we, we've spoken about media freedom and, and the dynamics in there. I just want a brief, and I told you I would, I would go back to it, RTI, okay. right to information. Yeah. We have it now, but 
uh, I said, right, you know, it's like a pipeline that has been blocked. You go to a certain extent and then uh, they tell you, you know, that's far and no farther. Of course, there are, there are, there are stipulations about what mm -hmm. you must do. But a lot of the time, whether it's the Ghana Airports Company Limited and our approach to getting information about um, frontiers, healthcare services, or about the fourth <coughs> state trying to get information from the GRA and the finance ministry, sometimes all you will get is a ping pong. They throw you here, then this one throws you there. Then maybe the RTI commission will come and find case closed. You don't get the information. What, what, what do you make of that and what will be your approach in making our state institutions more responsive to the law? Okay, so on the RTI, uh, quite recently, we've, we've been meeting the commission and even journalists like uh, uh, my good brother Samson Ladia mm -hmm. who were advocates for the passage of the RTI to see how best uh, we can work within the framework of the law. But to start with, let me commend the Access to Information Division of the Information Services Department. They are taxed with the responsibility to recruit, train, and deploy RTI officers to the various MDs. They are taxed with the responsibility to do the monitoring and analyze the data and come up with the reports. That being said, we have the RTI Commission that is more or less uh, the regulatory framework running RTI. Mm -hmm. And under the law, we, ha we have this appellate framework whereby if you go to an agency and demand information from an right. RTI officer or designated officer, right. and they refuse, the, the institution refuses to give or provide such information, mm -hmm. you can appeal or petition the commission for True. them to pursue it. And we've gone down that route. Yes, failure of which you can go to the, the high court right. to pursue for them to insist that they provide that information. Mm. That being said, there has been several instances where successfully uh, people have applied and gotten information. Right. Now, the challenge that we have within the Sometimes space, it's like pulling hair out of your nostrils. Exactly. Yeah. We are building a new system that is not known to the public service of the country. And the RTI applies to public organizations and organizations that are operating or collecting public funds. So they can also be private organizations. So imagine if uh, there is inadequate sensitization and you go to uh, one of the popular banks that you are coming to request for data and all that, if they are not exempt. If people don't understand, there will be some level of resistance. But now what is also complementing the implementation of RTI is that there is digitization of public records and data at various institutions. So those who are up to date are able to quickly uh, go through their systems and provide information. I mean, look at an institution like DVLA that has hundreds of thousands of records of vehicles registered from the 1980s. If they have old documents, their offices, they don't have places to keep the documents. They'll go to Pratt. Imagine you put in an RTI request and you require some information within 40 days. You will write to them. They will say, we don't have it. When we went to the box, the file was not there. Okay, we are going to archives, public archives. Okay, when we went, they said they won't find it. You need the information and the interpretation could also be that they have it, but they don't want to give it to me. But with the appellate framework... But, but sometimes with, and I, I've personally been involved at some point, sometimes with the posturing of these yes. institutions, it is clear, it is clear they don't want to give you the information because of whatever will be, will be exposed from there. I mean, let's not, let's not even... Sometimes so we have clear. to insist. Right. And we have to use the other framework the to make sure the court uh, forces them to give it. Right. And there's been instances where there's been fines. But I'm saying that where it is possible to get the information, the, the, the court will instruct that they have to give it to you at all costs. All right. I have some messages coming through. Irene Africanus Mensa says, I love Fatih so much. She deserves her new appointment. Congratulations, dear. Okay. And then Emmanuel Tetequao says, what a super intelligent, smart, and eloquent young lady we have in the Honorable Fatimatu Abubakar. So you have a lot of fans uh, watching us. Um, this morning. There are two little bits I want to run by you right before we go in, in about some two minutes. 
good governance uh, issues. Uh, let's talk about the railway sector, mm -hmm. uh, the economy. I mean, there have been moves. You've spoken about moves in recent times. I, I know we're getting some uh, trains from Poland yes. and all of that. Yes. Can, you, can you give us an update on, on that? Okay, first of all, you know there was an already uh, an existing contract mm. uh, with Afcons or Shalonji Shaponji from mm. India yeah. to construct the Temako Sobo railway line. Under this government, they reviewed the contract to increase it and also to pay for it to be extended all the way to Mpakadan. Mm. In fact, uh, the original plan to have a railway line from Temako Sobo did not include uh, an overbridge on the on the Volta River, yes. Mm. And I heard that from the CEO of the constructing company himself. I watched the documentary and he said the review was to add on a, a bridge and also to extend it so that we can have a 100-kilometer line from Tema to Mpakadan. It's, it's, it's a wonderful project because, first of all, uh, if it will reduce travel time, if it will help facilitate cutting uh, goods and all that, Accra is getting choked. A lot of people with some of those infrastructure can live far away and have the confidence that I'll be able to commute uh, in and out uh, as and when I'm required to do so. So by the grace of God, uh, government has procured and have built uh, 12 units under the Railway Development Authority and Ministry for Railways. And they've been carrying us along through the engineering and, and shipping and all that. And as mentioned earlier, we are expecting that by the end of this month, the first bus should be on their way to Ghana. Okay. And I won't take the wind out of their sail. The Ministry of Railway has done uh, such a fantastic job. And they, sh they should have the comfort of breaking the news <laughs> and right. communicating to the public on some of the good things that they have done. Right. The vision of the government is not just for the um, Tema and Pakadan project. There is a larger plan to extend all the way uh, to the north through the Eastern Corridor uh, to make sure uh, transporting goods and services uh, reaching out at some point in time even to our landlocked neighbors will be easier. And the pressure, the pressure on the roads will also reduce because all these uh, huge, huge tracks uh, go into our neighboring uh, landlocked countries all the time and the pressure they put on our public roads. I said that if we had alternative means of transport, it will go a long way to help us. So Ghanaians are excited, and I am as well, and I believe when they tack down, and the first, I, I may be one of the first people to board the coach, because I'll be happy to join right. uh, the team that will be doing the testing. In, in some 30 seconds, I, I just want a response on this. You are, you are a mother to many. Absolutely. And uh, there are many people who call you mother. Just this morning, we were discussing the school feeding program based on a story in the papers. And um, we had a call recently from some specific school. And mm -hmm. it's something that we've heard mm -hmm. in other schools where, for example, they are serving porridge and students are expected to bring their own sugar and, and bread. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this does not lie directly within your purview. It's mm -hmm. in education. But what do you think? How, how much more do you think we can do? to make our school feeding program better under free SHS? If I, if I, okay, the, the school feeding program is not under the free SHS. It's, mm -hmm. it's a separate it's a, it's a general, program right, for the basic, basic education. Right. And then we have the feeding component of yes. the free SHS mm -hmm. for the student and of course, the entire feeding framework under the boarding schools, right. under the free SHS. But with respect to the school feeding program, you would remember that uh, when this government came into office, uh, the coverage was quite limited, about some 1.6 million beneficiaries. Uh, that number has quickly doubled. And we are talking about over 11,000 caterers. The, the challenge has also been that across the country, of course, you have the regional coordinators and the district coordinators, but we are talking of over 10,000 schools across the countries. So when people claim that they have cooked, and then there is no... I like you, they claim they have cooked. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you, 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 you don't get the validation process right. You may be paying people, assuming that they are doing the work, but maybe it is not going as planned. Right. Let me also acknowledge that, of course, the allocation to the school feeding program is not 
as we would have expected it to be. Yeah. In, in 2016, 2017, it was 80 pesos per child. Yeah. Uh, under this government, it has been moved to one city, 20 pesos. Mm. And I remember the last time we had a media encounter with Honorable Lariba, she assured us that she was pushing so hard uh, to increase that quota so that it will also improve the quality of meals. But you know we are asking for all of these things from the same national kick to do the roads, uh, to do the hospitals, uh, to take care of the students, uh, to, pay, to pay for education of uh, doctors who are seeking to be saved. But we can still do it better. So, so of course, okay. we, we are all pursuing that. And right. If the government has the muscle to carry additional budget into that, I don't think His Excellency the President will hesitate to do so. It's been refreshing having you join us uh, in the studio for a conversation. Ben, thanks, thanks for, for having me. Um, the privilege of coming here and uh, maybe in further conversations in some, at some point in the future, we'll drill down into other issues. But thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for so much for having me. And I hope this is a see you again, not a goodbye. I'll be excited. Uh, oh, as for us, our doors are open. And for us to talk. Our doors as are I open. hope to operate an open door policy, okay. either for interviews at the ministry or if I'm required to come to the studio. If I had the information, it shall be delivered to you. <laughs> All right. And that is the information minister designate, uh, Fatih Abubakar. And uh, she's joined the conversation with us this morning. I hope and prayers are with her. And in the next few months, we'll see what she delivers as she now takes over as minister of information. But stay with me.